Welcome to the Ontario Trillium Foundation's Collective Impact Granting Stream webinar. This webinar will help you to understand what it takes to know you're making an impact. Further, Mark will explore how to build a continuous communications approach to your collective work. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Mark joined Tamarack in January 2016 to lead its Vibrant Communities Initiative and sits on Tamarack's team of directors. His background includes providing executive leadership to two Edmonton-based inner-city human service agencies focused on addressing poverty and homelessness, as well as providing consultation to a number of groups on issues related to social housing development, organizational change, strategy development, and leadership. Most recently, Mark served as CEO of Bissell Centre, where he led a team of 130 staff delivering Housing First services, assertive street outreach, family and children services, and programs in the area of mental health, addictions, homelessness prevention, FASD interventions, and employment services. Known for his big picture view and his ability to work on the ground, Mark has a long history of leading and contributing to social innovations that benefit low-income people. Examples include leading a collaborative design of a community bridge, homelessness prevention, developing a multi-purpose center with housing attached for inner city seniors, leading the development of three social enterprises, and developing innovative approaches to employing marginalized populations. I'll now turn things over to Mark. I'm glad to be here today and to be um, representing Tamarack with all of you and, and to be a part of the uh, Ontario Trillium Foundation and Tamarack partnership in bringing forward um, the collective impact model across the province of Ontario. Uh, so here's what we're going to do uh, for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. I'm, I am going to go over quickly uh, the conditions, and, well actually the preconditions and conditions of collective impact. There, this webinar is focused on continuous communication, so I'll be touching on that in more detail. And hopefully through the process, you'll discover some tools that can help deepen your understanding of collective impact and how to implement it. Next, please. Collective impact uh, is a disciplined, multi-sector collaborative approach to addressing complex social and or environmental issues on a large scale. There's five conditions and three preconditions, which I'll talk about in a bit. But they were first identified by John Kenny and Mark Kramer, as you may know, um, who are FSG social impact consultants. And they wrote an article that was published in the Stanford Social Innovation Review in 2011 about collective impact. And it was really an article based on some re research they had done uh, into, on, on behalf of some foundations looking into uh, were the uh, foundations funding impactful services. And, and what Kenny and Kramer found out is that indeed they were funding programs and services that were having impact on people, but they also noticed there were some of the initiatives that they reviewed that were actually having larger scale and often systems um, change. Uh, and so they started to get curious about that and to uh, to write about that. Um, next slide, please. So before we talk a little bit about collective impact, let's talk about what it's not. And uh, collective impact is a collaborative undertaking, but it's not collaboration as usual. Uh, often we use the word collaboration to describe a whole bunch of things. It could be coordination uh, and um, It could be um, coordination and other things that aren't necessarily collaboration. Also, also, collective impact is not a single sector approach. It does involve uh, numerous sectors in order to have large scale change. It's not a focus on an individual program or just on a single focused outcome. It's, it's more focused on a, on a matrix of outcomes that create impact. And then obviously it's not about having short-term impacts. We wouldn't come together to uh, just to work on short-term impacts. Next, please. 
So quickly, let's talk a little bit about the preconditions for collective impact. Influential champions, urgency of issue, and adequate resources. And um, big challenges, systems change, requires influential people and organizations from all sectors sitting at the table. An example would be, and I just I just ended my term as a as a task force member at Edmonton on the Mayor's Task Force to End Poverty, and the traction that we're having and the work we're doing um, was really because before we even started the task force, Mayor Iveson was a champion for ending poverty in Edmonton, and with just the fact that he was outspoken in everywhere he went, even before the Chamber of Commerce, about poverty reduction, created traction around what's become a collective impact movement in Edmonton's end poverty. The urgency of the issue has to be a shared urgency. Uh, if some people at the table don't see it as urgent, uh, well, they might not even show up if they don't see it as urgent, but there has to be a sense that we, in our community, have to do something about a particular issue or challenge. And then this is the tough one. There has to be adequate resources. And of course, you might ask yourself, what does adequate mean? And uh, it's not, I don't have the magic answer for you. But that has to be considered and discussed in terms of uh, not just money, where the money will come from. Maybe you won't have to talk. Eh? But so also, there is not your, maybe they organize it a little bit different. Sorry, Mark. I think we're getting some feedback from Ikam, who is one of our panelists. Ikam, oh. are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry, my phone was not mute yet. That's okay. Yeah, if you don't mind muting it, that'd be great. Okay, no problem. Thank right, you. Thank you. I thought I was hearing voices again. <laughs> not in your head, Mark. Yeah, okay. But All right, go ahead. There also needs to be discussion about time. How, how will we create and, and sustain the time we require to work together? Uh, and we need uh, an adequate number of people who are involved and willing to do things both at the table but also outside of the table and in between meetings. So these are, these are important conversations to have before we even would strike a collective impact table. So let's talk about the five conditions of collective impact for a little bit. Next, please. You can see them on the screen, and I'm not going to read those for you, but I want to speak a little bit uh, to them. So when it comes to a common agenda, uh, I sometimes think of a common agenda as also not just a shared vision, but a shared aspiration. It's something we're all aspiring to accomplish or to achieve. But it also, a common agenda also includes um, on having a, a shared understanding of a problem or issue uh, that we want to address, and then agreement on the, on the approach that partners agree to undertake to address it and solve it. Shared measurement is, is the condition that really distinguishes collective impact from other collaborative approaches. It speaks to using data to both define the initial problem or issue and also to track the group's progress over time. It assumes that the collaborative has agreed on methods for collecting and making sense of the data. This is not about just bringing our particular measures that each organization or group has to the table. It's about looking at how will we measure our collective work in a um, fairly straightforward and simplistic way. Mutually reinforcing activities that makes sense, seems like common sense, but the early impact of collective impact efforts is often achieved when a diversity of players learn how to better link up and align their various programs and services. And this is not just about service providers, it's about funders too, and uh, businesses who are at the table or labor organizations. How will groups that are coming from various sectors and have various roles come together to connect and to do work that reinforces the common agenda that we're all trying to achieve? Continuous communication, again, it makes common sense that we have this, but it includes a shared understanding amongst partners regarding how they will be with each other 
as well as considering how the collaborative keeps their respective organizations, as well as the public, informed of the progress and what they are learning. And keep in mind that along the way, uh, in terms of communication, people will come and go. New players will enter uh, the field of work. Uh, new members of the public will start wanting to know more. Uh, so the communication challenges are fairly significant in terms of keeping people informed along the way. And then backbone support. Um, we sometimes call them backbone organizations, but they don't necessarily have to be a distinct organization. But because there are a number of sectors at the table, different perspectives to work together, and uh, large-scale change that we're trying to, to undertake, uh, it takes investment of, of, of money and time and support. And if there's not a backbone role um, identified for a collective impact initiative, if, if we just expect people are going to do all this work off the corner of the desk to have any support, likely that collective impact venture is going to have a short life. Next, please. I love this quote from Stephen Covey because uh, it's so true. Uh, I'm sure many of you have sat around collaborative tables where the level of trust has not been what you would have hoped it would be. Uh, and we all know that until we can build that trust and keep building it along the way, it will be difficult for us you know, to work together. So let's talk a little bit, next slide please, about continuous um, communication. There are three aspects to it. Create formal and informal measures for pe keeping people informed. Uh, communication is open, reflects a diversity of styles. Different issues are surfaced, discussed, and addressed. So what, what might that look like in a little more detail? We, we all have our traditional ways of communicating. We're all uh, using email and probably overwhelmed by the times. I, I know I certainly am. Uh, we get on the phone. Uh, we can do um, uh, conferences on the phone. Uh, we use technology like we're using today. We have face-to-face -face meetings. These are kind of our traditional ways of, of operating. Uh, but they pose challenges when you've got a, a a multitude of people involved in a collective impact venture. So imagine um, all the emails you'll get about your collective impact work, uh, and every time you get one, they get they go further and further into your inbox and harder to find. Uh, and now imagine you're a new player who's come in a year later. How will you be brought up to speed on all that's happened uh, in order for you to understand um, what your role might be within the context of the work? So some of the challenges or some of the um, some of the considerations to give to how do you how do we create a continuous communications uh, effort uh, would be should there should there be a clearinghouse somewhere of key documents um, that shows some of the history of the plans it doesn't have to show all of the uh, all of the data that you may and, and, and emails that you may have gotten. But what are those key documents, and uh, where would we place them uh, so that people can access them easily, both current members but also new, new folks? So for example, should there be uh, an online place for that clearinghouse? Uh, might it be a wiki site where you can upload documents and download documents? Uh, you can actually attach um, some collaborative functions to a wiki site, and to including groups where you can actually have a conversation or ask a question, keep contact information that's kept up to date in real time. Uh, uh, wikis are quite an excellent tool for um, collaborative work. Or you might want to use different applications. I'm not pitching a particular one, but uh, applications like Yammer, which uh, I'm testing out right now with, with Tamarack staff, is a collaborative tool around uh, working together on projects. Basecamp is another I'm familiar with, maybe you are too. The ways of working together and keeping the outputs and, and the important information around the work we're doing in a central place. And then in terms of informal um, communication, that's what we might use social media for. So not just to keep people up to date, uh, give them a link where they can go read the latest 
news article or, or posting around the work we're doing, but also to use it as a way of just connecting with the public and trying to generate interest and support for what we're doing, whether it's through um, Twitter or um, Facebook or other, um, other tools. In terms of addressing difficult issues, my recommendation for any roundtable that's, that's actually looking into tackling major challenges around sy systems change uh, or, or big issues uh, that need to be addressed is to pay attention to uh, some shared learning around how do you actually, how do we actually engage with one another around difficult topics. Um, and so uh, it's probably advisable to include in the learning or some training, I prefer to call it learning, I guess, with, with the roundtable and others, how do you use tools like appreciative inquiry? How do you actually engage in dialogue around a particular issue or challenge without always getting um, positional about it? How do we have generative conversations in, um, that, that help us understand one another before we're just trying to move so quickly to agreements and uh, decisions. Understanding one another doesn't mean we have to always agree, but we can't really make good decisions if we don't understand. So I think continuous communication in a collective impact effort requires some ongoing learning and um, also facilitation of different ways of talking together and working with difficult um, challenges. Next, please. Here you see the preconditions and the conditions just all in one place. The only thing I, I want to mention about continuous communication is it actually is important during the preconditions too. Because it's in, during the preconditions, it's a small, probably, probably a smaller group of people that are, are working together. Uh, but they need to be in, in uh, communicating with each other in the same ways that the collective impact um, roundtable, for example, would need to to uh, work together. Next, please. So this is, in a sense, some fairly straightforward uh, communications concepts around uh, how do you communicate well, uh, who, who are you targeting, what's the message they need to hear, you want them to hear, and what's the outcome you want to achieve. Uh, and so think about the different audiences. There's funders, there's participants, participating agencies, there's various publics, including perhaps folks uh, with lived experience, if you're, for example, working on poverty. Um, there's traditional media that might be your target. And again, there's social media. And ask yourself when you're using uh, social media, are you trying to inform people? Are you trying to create a dialogue? Are you trying to advocate for something? Or all three. Um, but to really come up with a a way of looking at who your audiences are and the messages are, and then how will you have continuous and appropriate communications with them in clear and yet um, concise ways. Next, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these five uh, bullets, the collaboration spectrum, the impact, uh, journey map, values and principles, and the milestone report. And then we might uh, talk about other communication tools uh, that uh, you might want to actually talk about. Next slide, please. So here's a, a collaboration spectrum or continuum we use quite a bit um, to kind of explain um, kind of the range of things that we might experience when working with others. And from the far left, we know we compete with one another. Uh, in fact, when even sometimes when we're collaborating, we're competing for scarce resources. Uh, a lot of organizations in our community across all sectors coexist. They don't really have any systemic connections, uh, but they're there to do their, their job and, and have a purpose. Um, we communicate with one another, and, and sometimes that's just to keep each other informed, and often we cooperate. But where collective impact really starts to emerge is, is in the last three, in terms of coordinating, collaborating, and often integrating the work we're doing 
into a common effort. So there are three kind of characteristics of collective impact that distinguish it from other forms of collaboration. I've already mentioned collective impact is multi-sectoral, so it focuses on collaboration across multiple sectors, specifically including both for-profit business and also people with the lived experience of the issue at hand. It emphasizes the rigorous use of data. Partners in a collective impact effort do agree upon and monitor their progress using agreed upon data measures. Data is also used to inform the focus and emphasis of the collective impact effort at the outside. It's not just meant to evaluate. Um, it's meant to challenge thinking along the way, to learn what's going right and what's going not so right, and to inform adaptation or future strategies uh, in order to achieve uh, the aspirations of the common agenda. The collective impact focuses on programs and systems beyond simply aligning programs. Collective impact also pays attention to what is needed to change the broader system in which the issues exist, typically by uh, things like policy change, legislative, legislative change, and uh, changes in how funding works, both in terms of funding principles and practices. So. You can see how those three, those three areas that I just talked about require uh, the kind of coordination, collaboration, and often integration of efforts as indicated on the spectrum. Next, please. So, one of the things to ask ourselves when we're, we're looking at uh, a collective impact effort is where are we right now in terms of collaboration? Uh, most likely, we'll be bringing folks to the table, some who know each other, uh, others who don't, some folks who may not always agree or get along. And so to understand the nature of collaboration as it exists amongst the people on the table is probably a good conversation to have uh, in order to start having a conversation about where do we want to go and what it will take to get us there. So there is an outcome that's not just about the impact that we want to achieve with collective impact, there's also the outcome of getting aligned or on, around how we will collaborate. So it's not just about what we want to accomplish, but the how of that, which is preparation. What motivates people? What worries do they have? What doubts do they have coming to the table? Uh, there will be people at the table, probably most people, who are wondering what's in it for me, and by me, they might be me the organization. Um, so being able to have honest, frank, but also convivial conversations about the collaboration spectrum is important uh, in order to move forward. Next, please. One very helpful communication tool is an impact strategy map. And again, keep in mind, this is a, a, a kind of a map that can be shared with people as they come into the effort. Um, collective impact efforts are typically open systems, people come and go. So they, they can provide partners with a timeline and key outcomes along the way. Uh, they can be present or brought forward at, at each partner meeting. Uh, it could be used as orientation, for example, of new members or as a reminder if people think they're strained from, a, from the path they want to be on. But, they, but that map can also be adjusted as the project moves along um, and can show the movement and progress that's happening. So it also uh, can be a living document that is kind of, that is shared in a visual way, or can be shared in a visual way, like the next slide uh, demonstrates. So there's two, um, two things I want to stress about this. First of all, there's stages to the work. And, you know, there's creating the team, there's building the framework, uh, working on those conditions, and then 
there's always the refining of that work. Uh, the first draft is never really good enough. Uh, and often the refining stage involves other people plugging into the work. There's uh, connecting of what we call sharing with the top 100. Uh, and by that we mean it's important um, to identify those influential people and organizations from across the se all sectors that you either want to be a, a part of the collective impact initiative or you want them connected to it because they can influence things when you need them to. And um, so they become great allies. So there's an exercise to go through about identifying together who those top 100 are. And then you move on to strategies. Um, the top 100 can help you inform them. And then you get to implication. And in this particular example, you know, it started in August 2015. and, and, and in June of 2016, they implemented. Just coming off the work uh, again that I did with uh, the mayor's task force, our process to get to implementation was about 18 months uh, to get to a strategy of the group consultations after forming the tables uh, and to do the work uh, that um, was required to develop a strategy. And then from there to do the work that was required to create what they call the implementation roadmap. So it's important to be realistic about the timeline. And you can't always predict at the beginning how long it will take, but it won't take just a couple of months. Um, and having this kind of roadmap, um, I think, is helpful, especially when there's some images involved, it's just a short way of looking at the process that you're going to have to go through. Next, please. Talk a little bit about community impact principles of practice. Um, and I'm not going to read them all to you, but uh, you can read for yourself. But I, do want, I wanted to talk about the second bullet in terms of making sure that we understand that our work is grounded in values about what matters which is really about our shared values, what matters to us collectively. And that's a conversation that sometimes uh, isn't always that easy. I've sat around the table with, with folks who are quite, who see politics and economics and social issues quite differently from how I do. And to understand what, what values need to guide our work together is an important conversation to have. We need to know that what we're doing is based on evidence about how to be so how to be effective. Um, but we also uh, need to understand that sometimes a direction, especially if it's an innovative one, may pose some contrary perspectives to evidence-based work. And we need to be able to have uh, those conversations. We need to understand that everything is contextual and uh, to our local environment and answer the makeup of the table uh, and we need to be focused on making informed choices along the way, um, understanding that uh, this is a process and a journey uh, and that we're all trying to work towards the same uh, outcomes and impacts. If you think about it, the five conditions of collective impact are the what and the principles in the sense are the how, how uh, in terms of how we we'll work together. So next slide, carry on with this theme. So principles of practice is to design and implement the initiative with a priority based on equity. So we need to make sure that in a cross-sectoral effort, uh, peoples and organizations are being heard in an equitable way. It may not be an equal way, but everyone that, that's there should have a voice in uh, ways of um, participating uh, that might involve language challenges, or cultural education issues. Include community members in the collaborative and to do so in a way that's uh, authentic it's not just about having someone with lived experience sitting around the table. How does the structure of your effort maintain 
an activity with the, with the public, especially those uh, whose lives are trying to improve upon a chain. Uh, we need to recruit and co-create with cross-sector partners. This isn't about a bunch of us doing something, inviting people from other sectors to the table and saying, here's what we're doing. Uh, again, use data to continuously learn, adapt, and improve. And notice even in there, we're not saying evaluate, even though that's part of the process. Cultivate leaders with unique systems, leadership skills. <coughs> Excuse me, but also if you're working in the community, look at how you can build capacity in the community amongst the public and people with good experience in terms of their leadership. And don't just focus on programs, but focus on program changes, adaptations, new services, and systems strategies. And, and understand that we're building a culture together. And we need to foster good relationships based on trust with respect across all participants, even if we don't always agree with one another. Next, please. So one um, key communications tool is what we call milestone reports. They're short, two or three pages. Uh, they capture the core decisions that have been made by your collective impact effort. Uh, one, to remind all of you around the table of what's going on, but also uh, other stakeholders who are watching and interested and engaged in what you're doing. It needs to be kept up to date. It's a great orientation uh, tool. And uh, I really stress, this is the, it's a challenge to write short documents, but I, I really stress, especially if you want public engagement, to keep these things very concise because the general public isn't going to be interested, and many of us aren't either, in a 20-page report updating with what we've done over the last six months, for example. So what does a key milestone report look like? Uh, what's some of the key aspects of it? Next slide, please. So this is not a prescription, but more of just a guide in terms of um, in a report that some will have read before, but others will be reading for the first time, and make sure there's a, a clear overview of what the initiative is and why it was started, and a little bit about its progression. Uh, a little bit about the key research which informs the effort. It doesn't have to be a, a long, winding research report, but it could be highlighting some of the key research um, some of the key research that was referenced with uh, linking people to other places where they can read more. What are the key strategies, or the game, I call them game changer strategies in the collective impact process um, that you want people to pay attention to in a key milestone report? Uh, some of the key achievements that have been addressed, but also some of the pressures or challenges and opportunities that are coming, and what are some of the key upcoming implementation strategies. Your version might look different, but um, it, it's uh, important to have a, a concise, but um, kind of comprehensive, I know that seems like a contradiction, but concise and comprehensive short summary of what's going on with your collective impact initiative. And in fact, in, my, in some of the work I'm doing in trying to um, mirror what I'm telling you, I'm trying to explore how some of the work Driving Communities Canada could be doing could have key milestone reports that actually are infographics, easy to read, easy to understand quickly, and then can link people um, to other uh, sources of information. So, uh, you, you know, key, key milestone reports are important. Paying attention or asking yourselves, do we need to use technology to increase our communication, like Wikisites or Yammer or Basecamp? How are we going to use social media to inform uh, and engage uh, our stakeholders and the general public? Uh, and you have, you know, what other tools might we use beyond email and phone and meetings for us to be able 
uh, to have continuous communication across the work we're doing. So I'm curious, uh, if you go to the next slide, in, in addition to what I've mentioned, in your work, because you're all doing work in community, do you have any tools you use and could tell us about that have really helped your collaborative efforts as you've been working uh, with others? Anybody have a have a, a tool or an idea? If not, we can also start moving to any questions or comments or ahas you might have had. I'll do my best to answer any questions you have. Um, Stephanie, do you coordinate all that? Yeah, I do. Um, I, we actually have a couple of people answering to the tools question that you had. Sally Lee says that she uses Google Docs. Uh, Yvette Roberts. Um, she says if you consider monthly meeting minutes a tool. Uh, Amy Mac Doodle Doodle Poll by Google and Health Chat. Um, and then we have a question for you here from Sheila Morrison. Did Tamarack review any research about social networking tools before deciding to implement Yammer? If so, could links or citations to those resources be made available? Um, well, the research that was done on Yammer was actually done by me before I came to um, before I came to uh, Tamarack, and I won't I won't say it was I won't call it research. It was more of uh, investigation and trying things out. The reason why we're testing Yammer is that we're uh, Tamarack's a virtual organization, and we all use Office 365, and Yammer is owned by Microsoft. It integrates with Office 365. And as a collaborative tool, we're testing that out to see if that can in increase and improve our ability to collaborate, especially on projects that uh, teams are working on. And so far, so good. Um, I've used Basecamp, and um, I, I like Basecamp, but it, it, to me, it wasn't as friendly and integratable in, in, with the other tools that we use. So. One of the keys around collaborative software is how well is it integratable with your current enterprise software. Google products, for example, um, can integrate quite well with, uh, with one another. So if you wanted a wiki site and you used a Google site, Google Docs and spreadsheets and forms all integrate, as well as Google Groups, all integrate into that wiki uh, format quite nicely uh, and easily. So integration is a, is a key aspect of using tools. You don't want a lot of standalone tools that create more work because you have to bridge between them in manual kinds of ways. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, great. We have another question here from Fiona Weeks. When you talk about the urgency of the issue as a precondition for collective impact, do you have any ideas about how to generate that urgency if it's not a current political or pro or programmatic priority? Well, um, one of the things that that starts to help people understand uh, urgency is data and information, and also uh, people who can speak to the urgency. So, in the early days of some of the work that, uh, that I was doing here in Edmonton, uh, we looked at uh, data and uh, and I'll be honest I was I was because I've worked in the field of poverty reduction for quite a few years I thought okay here we go again going over the same data but then I had to remember that most of the people have never looked at that data that were sitting across the table from me and once they started to see and I'm using poverty as an example but you would have your own examples based on the issue you're addressing once they started to see what income challenges people had, how low welfare rates were, the health conditions that people who are poor experience, or the uh, decreased life expectancy, uh, how poverty impacts children's education and health, and on and on, uh, the urgency evolved out of just trying to understand the issue and the challenge. And uh, in Alberta, although our political um, situation has changed, uh, with the NDP in power, 
there often was not a lot of provincial support for poverty reduction uh, as there seems to be now. But there certainly is local support for it, and people need to get together with those who are their allies and are interested in uh, addressing an urgent issue and then helping others to understand why it's urgent. Great. Thanks, Mark. We had a couple people um, sharing some of their programs. Nation Builder is Mo Grahan's favorite tool. River because it integrates with Dropbox. Um, Sheila uses Slack. Um, and we have Denise on tools we've found face-to-face -face facil facilitated meetings important for sharing perspectives, building trust, and facilitating equitable participation, although it can be challenging to get people together for these. Yeah, we don't want to underestimate. If we can get in the same room, that's the best way to communicate. Just not always easy to do. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, it looks like that's it for questions right now, but feel free to keep throwing them in uh, to the question box as we start to wrap up here. Um, but thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your insights and perspectives on the call with us today. And while we wait, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying I'm glad to be here. I, I hope it was helpful. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Ikem right now. We have Ikem here from OTF uh, to take us through some Ontario Trillium granting stream information. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, and that was that was really good to follow along with some of the conversation and uh, and the thinking about what's been happening. I think uh, continuous communication is definitely one of the things that we talk about a lot in the conversations we have with potential applicants or potential uh, collaborators here and its importance cannot be overstated. Um, so I just have a couple of quick uh, slides that are a bit more administrative in nature just to tell you a bit about what um, the Territorial Foundation and uh, what and who we are for those of you who may not know. And you know the, the, the key part there I think for the purpose of the conversation is that uh, last bullet point about our impact uh, gives you a bit of a you know 50,000 foot view of what we're looking to achieve and what we think our investments have the capacity to do um, over the next decade that aligns with some of our thinking about how to conceptualize what collective impact can do and to, for us that make grants at different levels and scales all the time to start to think bigger and longer and more in depth than a project and a program but thinking about how to um, as, as we like to say change the landscape of, of, the, of what you're trying to do and uh, really amplify the impact by bringing all of the preconditions, conditions, and all the, the mechanisms of collective impact um, together. And um, on the next slide, we talk a little bit about what the uh, uh, sort of our key term there is. is. You know, collective impact is our how we hope and intend to bring fundamental change um, with collective action. And uh, I'm glad that we've already sort of we are agreeing that collective impact is not just collaboration as usual. There is a, a huge element of collaboration involved, but it, it really allows us to think um, outside of what collaboration typically is, but be, be intentionally aware and seek those unintended solutions on unintended um, ahas and spurs at the moment that will come as a result of collaborating, testing, retesting, and and building a really um, broad-based collective around the discipline that it requires to really change and lever specific social issues. Um, and on the next slide is just some, some basic contact information for us if you want to start a conversation with the foundation around what a collective impact uh, partnership with us would, would look like. I would really like to say that unlike our other granting I, our, our other granting streams, our collective impact approach is, is significantly more hands-on. So the best way to begin the conversation with us is to contact us through any one of those coordinates there, email or phone uh, or a program manager to start discussing what you want to achieve and 
thinking through some of those questions around the, the that, that intractable social or you know potentially huge social problem, social opportunity initiative that you want to take advantage of. Um, and the question that I always pose to folks when I have that conversation with them is, you know, at the, at the, at the, after 10 years or 15 years have passed, what will be fundamentally different or what will have changed because of this conversation that we've started today? Those are the kinds of things that we invite folks to think about and get in touch with us and let's talk about how we can partner on a, on a collective impact initiative. We are a grant maker, so making grants is one of the key ways that we contribute to change in community, but it's specifically with collective impact and some of the shifts in our investment strategy and approach over the last few years, we're finding that just as importantly as just as important as the grants is the, the learning and the partnerships and the connections that we get to make and we have the opportunity to make as collaboratives and collectives come in to do work with us. So that's that's essentially what I think. I don't think there's another slide after this one. Um, no, so iterate, just get in touch with us as soon as you have that kernel of an idea that you've you've sort of looked at some of the literature around collective impact and you're fairly certain that this is something that not only requires but also benefits from wrapping a collective impact approach around it. Get in touch with us. Um, very relatively friendly, and uh, let's have a conversation. That's it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ikem. Uh, before we all go, I just want to highlight a few upcoming events on Tamarax and most notably our Community Change Institute at the end of September, September 26th to 30th in Toronto. Uh, it's five days and consists of 40 workshops, 250 global change makers, and four world-renowned speakers. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please feel free to email myself, Stephanie, at tamaracommunity.ca or visit our events page, um, which you can just see at the link at the bottom there. And don't feel like you have to scribble it down right now. We will be sending this whole slide deck um, as well as a recording out as soon as we can after this webinar. We also have our Evaluating Community Impact in Hamilton from November 15th to 17th. And a few more upcoming webinars. Again, we have one directly related to the Community Change Institute tomorrow with Mark Holmgren, who we just heard present, as well as Severin Kulis Suzuki. So that's tomorrow from 12 to 1, and feel free to register that on the events page as well. Um, and then we have a couple more OTF webinars, as you can see there, August 17th, 25th, and September 12th. So thank you all so much for joining us today, and thank you for your comments and questions. You helped make it a very dynamic and thought-provoking conversation. Um, so do email us if you have any feedback or comments about these calls. We really appreciate it. And thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.